Alaska. He would have been considered a rash prophet who five years ago predicted it would one day become a great and powerful state. So wrote an authority in the National Geographic magazine in 1902, a time when fields of gold were thought to be in endless supply. Today, the gold has all but gone, yet man persists in channeling the vast wealth contained in the earth and sea to his purposes. Caught up by the frontier spirit and equipped with new technology, he continues to challenge the harsh, stubborn forces of nature and appears to be winning. Is he now, as in the past, simply exploiting and plundering only to leave when he is done? Or will he stay to make the prophecy of greatness for this awesome, majestic land a reality at last? What is said of Alaska's glacier-covered country, it controls man, should also apply to its ostensibly lush terrain. Homesteads are free for the asking on 300 million acres of public lands, but even the government regards them mostly unsuitable for cultivation. Yet it is the nature of Alaskans not to accept the conclusions of others. Bob Watkins was born in Kentucky and worked as a mechanic in Detroit before coming north in 59. Having met the requirement for ownership, 20 acres cleared and tilled within five years, this 160-acre homestead is now his. Starting this year, Bob and his family of five plan to live here permanently. While the odds are against them, the government estimates two-thirds of all homesteads will fail. They believe their few head of cattle and small crops of peas, oats, and barley will eventually grow to commercial size and provide them with a comfortable income. In the meantime, they will live off their own land. There are nearly six million acres of spruce and hemlock in the south coastal region alone. Within a few years, the logging industry has grown to become second only to fishing in the state's economy. Most of the timber will be pulverized and serve as the base for synthetic fibers, much of it for export to Japan, Alaska's prime potential market. A spar tree is the focal point of the complex operation required to pull the felled trees down from the mountainous slopes. Throughout its history, Alaska's natural wealth has brought men here. For fur, for fish, for gold they came, took what they wanted, and left the land barren. Only recently has conservation become an important concern for government and industry alike. And closely supervised advanced reforestation programs ensure both controlled cutting now and new, healthier forests in the future. Anchorage is Alaska's boom town. 121,000 people, nearly half the state's population, live in this area, and it's still growing. Remote from the South 48 states, its people are perhaps more spiritedly American than anywhere else in the nation. So they must be, to carve out a modern society in this inhospitable country. Partly by choice, partly by necessity, they live off their land, King crab, moose, and caribou, countless kinds of fresh salmon and trout are frequent substitutes for beef and pork. Hey, come and get it. To bring people and prosperity to Alaska, reliable, inexpensive transportation must yet be developed. The recent inaugural of a ferry system of three giant ships marks an important step forward. Formally isolated from each other, the seven towns along the rugged, broken southeast coastline have now begun to engage in constant, productive exchange. At Haines, the traveler must finally take the wheel for approximately 700 miles of dusty, rough road to Fairbanks or Anchorage. From Anchorage, another ferry route ties together and makes easily accessible a number of southwestern towns. But one cannot expect to traverse Alaska on land and water alone. For good reason is it called the flyingest state. Bill Garrett, 
a National Geographic editor and photographer, has been covering the new state and its people for several years. We met Pete Sesson as a bush pilot with a service to sell, but came to cherish him as a friend. He's as open as the country he served for 20 years, flying families, food, mail, and spare parts to remote fishing and logging communities, handling every kind of emergency as well, some at great risk to his own safety. He and a handful of fellow pilots are the lifelines of this spectacular frontier. 3-5, Foxtrot, catch a can. 3-5, Foxtrot, catch a can. 3-5, catch a can, go ahead. Hey, Roger, Pete, we have an emergency out at Thorn Bay. I will be a stretcher case, over. 3-5, catch a can, do they have a stretcher available? They do have a small stretcher available. Roger, Roger, on the way. Emergencies, the bush pilot asks few questions. He just goes. Pete's intimate knowledge of 80,000 square miles of this untamed land has proved indispensable many times. To some 160 expected mothers, he got them all to the hospital on time, as well as to 70 search and rescue missions for lost aircraft. Alaskans need each other. Pete knows the next search could be for him. The Athabasca Indians of Tionic, an isolated fishing village on the Cook Inlet, have lived a long time without a cultural heritage, and like most of Alaska's native population, without decent housing and medical attention as well. The tribe's leader, Albert Kaloa, recalls a poverty-stricken childhood, during which there appeared no hope for a better future. Then, in 1962, oil companies came to Tionic. New homes, 60 of them, were the first order of the day when the village received $12 million for options on some of its land. Although millions more in royalties are expected after production begins, the fortune is regarded as communal rather than personal property. The men are continue earning their own livings. While many are learning new trades from construction to oil rigging, Al prefers to stick to his old one, commercial salmon fishing. Foremost fisherman in Tionic, he's usually been able to make enough in the month-long season to support his family through the year. Many of his fellow villagers, however, are seldom as successful. This summer, the village inaugurated its own Head Start program. Al pointed out how since their sudden prosperity, he could see a change in the people. Kids smiled now, and many of the grown-ups had put on 20 pounds. Education is perhaps their most vital concern. College had always been an unthinkable luxury, no longer. A new public school is scheduled to open soon. But the 270 Tionics aren't stopping here. They pledge themselves and their capital to helping all the native peoples of Alaska achieve a similar high standard of living and degree of independence. Alaska's capital, Juneau, population of 10,000 is reached only by sea or air. It boasts the most moderate climate in the state, in the 60s during the summer, the 30s in the winter. Another source of pride is its nine-hole million-dollar golf course. The grass-free fairways are literally a priceless sight, but with every step and stroke the player touches gold, tailings from the old Juno gold mine dating back to 1880. That was the year of Joe Juno's discovery, the first major strike in Alaska. Suddenly, this far unknown country, relegated to oblivion by the public and government, demanded respect. Restless adventurers and prospectors, already finding the Wild West too civilized, came first. Then, 17 years later, the world rushed in. For gold, tons of it, had been uncovered in the Klondike. Farmers and doctors, barbers, bankers, and housewives 
more than 100,000 people left their homes in quest of quick fortunes in the Yukon. Gold in the millions was to be had, but only a chosen few would ever find it. Fewer keep it. It was a time for legends, and each of the nearly 40,000 souls who finally reached the Klondike's capital, Dawson, could rightfully claim his own, for the journey itself was a challenge of monumental proportions. Weather and geography as formidable as any place on earth denied entry to all but the most hardy and determined. The major routes through Alaska began in Skagway and Daye, 600 tortuous miles away. Like Dawson, Skagway became an overnight boom town, swelling to 15,000 at its peak in 98. During that year, the lawless rule by Soapy Smith and his gang of con men, thieves, and swindlers forced one seasoned traveler to conclude it was about the roughest place in the world, little better than a hell on earth. Soapy's brief, colorful career was ended by a bullet, and the town transformed itself into a law-abiding, church-going community. It prospered for three more years. Crowds no longer stream down Broadway, yet remarkably Skagway survives. Cherishing their past, the 750 inhabitants take watches during freezing winter storms to safeguard the lifeless haunted buildings against fire. Skagway has no substantial year-round industry, but now it is the last stop on the ferry route and tourism provides a saving grace from complete economic disaster. Within three hectic months, its citizens must earn their annual living, usually from a wide variety of jobs. Good to see you. Good to see you. How's everything going? Pretty good. Yeah. How are you? How are you? The floor can't afford to relax during these valuable summer days. Besides greeting all the ships that enter the port and running a hotel, he serves as a local travel agent, airline representative, official weatherman, and also manages the local TV station. We probably have the smallest station in the world right here. It's costly, but it's still nice to see what's going on in the rest of the world. When the Chichacos, as the Indians called the excited, wild-eyed strangers in their midst, set out for the Klondike, they had little idea what dangers and agony lay directly before them. Two state foresters and a local wrangler joined the Garretts to ride, walk, and climb the infamous Chilkoot Trail. Infamous because it would take many a gold-crazed tenderfoot three months to conquer these first 35 miles to the Yukon. It was wintertime then. Blizzards and a ton or more of supplies slowed movement to a snail's pace. There was death along the Chilkoot. Suicides, murders, and pneumonia. One gigantic avalanche of ice and snow took more than 60 lives. Yet few turned back. The horses have been returned to Skagway. Only pack mules could master the terrain from here on. By now, the weary Klondikers had discarded all luxuries. Trunks of jewelry and fancy clothes spotted the landscape. Before reaching the Chilkoot Pass, many a greenhorn had also surrendered his bankroll to Soapy Smith's cleverly disguised con men. Beasts of burden could not go beyond the scales. Here, all supplies were weighed before the final ascent of the Chilkoot Pass itself. For those who could afford Indian packers to carry their goods, the rate was a dollar a pound. This, then, was the Argonauts' first major test of strength, endurance, and patience. 3,500 feet to the summit and the Canadian border. 40 trips back and forth to the scales to get all supplies up. No one permitted to cross with less than 1,100 pounds of food. Lose your place in the creeping line, 
and you lose a day, perhaps more if a storm strikes. 22,000 men, women, and children climbed this pass in the winter of 98. yearning for wealth had brought them from Greece and Japan, Australia and Scotland, Florida and Texas. On the inhuman Chilkoot, the gold became a burning obsession. Five hundred and fifty miles of wilderness still lay ahead. The gold seeker had to decide, should he go on? Dog teams would now take him to a lake where boats could be built for the trip down the Yukon. But some men, their heavy loads of boat kits safely on the top, had had enough of this defiant country and returned to civilization. Preferring heartbreak to insanity, they left behind 70 years ago these warped symbols of their dreams. Two years after the first stampede, the first leg of a narrow gauge railway was opened between Skagway and Bennett Lake in the Yukon. This incredible engineering feat signaled the doom of the treacherous Chilkoot. For four days, we walked over the bones of a gold rush. Dreams of wealth alone couldn't explain the mass hysteria. I'm sure it was also the glamour of the rush and the urge to be a part of this adventurous country, which compelled thousands to take the torturous trip to the Klondike. And those who made it all the way only to find the gold already staked couldn't consider themselves failures, for they'd written a unique chapter in the history of human courage and imagination. The terminus of the Mendenhall Glacier on the outskirts of Juneau is one of Alaska's unique, impressive, and most easily approached visual wonders. The Mendenhall, together with a number of other gargantuan rivers of ice, comprise the 1,500 square mile Juneau ice field. The glacier is one of the Earth's most delicate recorders of climatic change, and thus do students and scientists come here to analyze its past, present, and future. This ice field in particular, due to its intense storms and exceptional snowfall, is perhaps the most climatologically sensitive in the world. Sometimes over a hundred feet of snow falls here annually. The succeeding year's deposits compress it to a fraction of that depth. And as the scientist descends a crevasse, he may read a record of the glacier's life in the delineated layers of ice. With other research results, he may determine not only how fast it is moving, but how far. mile-long Alaska Highway runs from Dawson Creek in Canada to Fairbanks, Alaska. Today's traveler, having taken the ferry up the southeast coast, need drive only part of it, about three days' worth. In 1942, 16,000 soldiers and civilians worked around the clock for six mud-filled, mosquito-ridden months to complete this epic task. The road has changed little. It is still mainly unpaved, dusty, and bumpy. The scenery also remains the same, uncluttered and magnificent. Between Fairbanks and Anchorage, there lies an area to which the men and women of these growing cities find themselves increasingly drawn. Mount McKinley National Park is their retreat, 3,000 square miles of unspoiled wilderness. Rising 20,320 feet, the lofty peak of Mount McKinley may be seen for hundreds of miles. Here, landscape and wildlife join together to form the special sense of freedom that to Alaskans is Alaska. Our last frontier, still undeveloped and untamed, welcomes with open arms 
all who would build a new society. The contemporary Alaskan, however, doesn't think of himself as a trailblazer, rather as an individual in search not of wealth, but self-respect and meaning. Not social status, but independence. And unlike the adventurers of old who came to plunder, then leave, he plans to stay.